welcome to the Speaking Podcast. You can find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com. We're also on BitChute and YouTube as Speaking Podcast. I also have the Awakening Podcast, the Learn Polish Podcast, the Meditation Podcast, and the Crypto Podcast. And all can be found on rycolin.com. And Dave is probably, you know, wondering how I'm doing five because he, I know he's a, another podcaster himself as well as being a, a very successful businessman and a number one be- best-selling author. So please welcome Dave Molinda. Good morning, sir. I'm just honored to be here hanging out with you. And I'm wondering how to get on that Learn Polish podcast. That's what I got to do is learn more. So is that like learning more uh, Polish every week? Is that is that the plan yeah, I, on that one? I actually, how I, I'll tell you how I got into it. I wanted to improve my Polish. And the only okay. ones that I could find were scripted or they were only in Polish. And when you don't have much Polish, that's hard to do. So my ex-wife is a Polish teacher. I have a great relationship with her. And we do five to 10 minutes twice a week, but we do it in a fun way. And they're all different wow. topics, but you could just keep listening. And I mean, it's like on the YouTube, we just hit a million and there's over 300,000 or something like that on the audio itself. So it's you know, very successful. It's been number one in a lot of countries. So you should check it out because especially Must be your know, ex-wife, huh? Must be your ex-wife. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, <laughs> how I started to improve with the marketing because yeah. I mean, I know you're, is I started using her picture because you know, beautiful Polish blonde woman, it definitely There you helps. go. Exactly. That's awesome. Well, thanks again for having me on your show. No problem. So I always like uh, my guests to introduce themselves to the audience. So Dave, you might let them know who you are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dave Melendez, my name. Uh, Positive Polarity is my company, and we're a leadership development sales training organization and do a lot of speaking in regards to that. And I think uh, you probably know, Roy, most people say, are you like a trainer that speaks or are you a speaker that trains? So you know, the jury's still out on which one I am. I love to do both. So um, again, just honored to hang out and share some great tips today for anybody interested in uh, learning more about speaking. Excellent. And just before we delve into the different things, because I have a list of questions here, sure. I, I always like to know your journey. So as you were a young boy, you know, we had the, the guy at the back of the corner or up the front with your hand up or up teaching the rest of the class. <laughs> You know what? It's such a great question. I actually was the one up in front, but I was still an introvert. So I, I just actually had somebody on my podcast talking about introvert versus extrovert. And I do, you know, enjoy being at the front. But I tell you, once it's done, it really takes all my energy. So then I kind of migrate to the back. So I kind of do both. But I enjoy being at the front. And I was at, I was at the front as a little kid and then uh, just kind of kept going from there. So personality wise, I enjoy being in front of people, Roy. So again, that's why I jumped at this opportunity to be in your show. Brilliant. So I know that with speaking, communication is a big thing. And I know that's something that you cover. So like maybe communicating to the audience as well as communicating to kind of employees, you might kind of sure. delve, delve Absolutely. into yeah, I mean, obviously, communication is what we're, what this is all about. The, the research that I have done, I realized that about 85% of our success is not due to our education. It's not due to our drive. It's not even due to our passion. It's actually due to how well we communicate. And this is such a great show because I think, like, if you started this show in Polish, I wouldn't even be able to communicate with you at all because I don't know that language. And I think that's a lot how it it works in communication. We all have our style. And if we don't remember that the person we're communicating with has their style, we're really going to misfire at times. And even in speaking, when you're standing in front of a group, if you remember that there's different styles that are out there and you're able to kind of hit each one, uh, you'll definitely do much you know, better in your speaking career and have much more success than if you just focus and always do it the same way. Okay. So I've seen you, I'm, I'm not sure, were they like in events or workshops? I've looked at some of the videos and I mean, you could see the testimonials, obviously, how do you want, were they workshops or events? What's uh, what's your typical kind of thing that you're doing? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I do a lot of both, Roy, because I mean, I for me, I just love to 
to help people. My thought process is if, if you leave an event better than you came and I had something to do with it, then that's success. And I think all of us have been to events and we've invested a day or an hour or whatever the time frame, and you leave and you go, that was really good. But then you go right back to your day. You know, you kind of don't implement anything that you learn. So I don't really cover a ton of content in one training. It's more about covering in depth and trying to understand how we can have somebody walk away implementing one or two things. You know, even to the point where at the end of the session, I typically say, look at your notes and, you know, or go back into your memory bank and think of one thing or two things that you learned that you want to put into practice right away this afternoon. Because again, you know, we've all sat through something. And so that was really great. And then we just go right back to our regular activity and there's really no behavior modification. And there's no thought process modification. We just, like I said, go back to the norm. So I think it's helpful for speakers to really hone in on making sure that they, the audience leaves with one or two tidbits of information that will allow them to you know, make a change permanently in their life. And say with the workshop, then I'm not sure how many hours you would do. Would you do typically an hour and a half? Or how would you structure? Because I've seen somewhere you had uh, like a PowerPoint, but they weren't something that people are reading off. Are you? And you mentioned handouts as well. So do you actually get people to kind of complete something, or are you getting them yeah. to engage one on one? What's your structure? Yeah, it's a combination of. It depends. So I have a like a customer service boot camp, for instance, that we do. It's four sessions long. You know, each one's about an hour and a half. We could fit it in in one day. I've done it for companies in one day, or we could do it, you know, over time. But the reality is, is people learn one of three ways. They either learn by hearing, they learn by seeing, or they learn by doing. So if you as a speaker don't understand that and you focus on one piece, you know, like for me, I'm a visual person and two thirds of the people that are probably, you know, your your audience are you know they learn by seeing so if somebody's going to stand in front of me for an hour and not have any visual aids not have a handout not have anything all i do is focus on that person and and listen to their words i'm going to struggle with that as opposed to somebody that has visual aids so i try to have something tangible that i can show them you know, I use Mr. Potato Head, I use Lucy and uh, Charlie Brown. I mean, I use a whole variety of different things because people really need to be able to, you know, um, connect with that. And if you just, again, focus on your verbal skills, that's great. It's just that you're missing some of the people that learn in different ways. So I try to spread that out, understanding that we have a, a, a different, you know, myriad of people in the audience. Okay. And like, I'm not sure if you've spoken internationally, but I know you've spoken nationally. So yes. how have you adjusted with like, because I, I, I class America as like Europe, all different countries, not just all states. Like, you know, sure. so, so how did you adjust to the different ones to make sure you connected the red the best way? Yeah, I don't think that there's and maybe this is a blind spot that I have, but I don't think different states really have a, a vast difference of audience. I haven't spoke anywhere outside of the U.S. Um, my focus has been in the U.S. Um, not that I wouldn't, it just that's been my focus. And so, you know, there's little pockets of things. Maybe you'll have a, some people might have a little more uh, laid back mentality. Some people more, more like a let's get this done mentality. So, you know, the energy in the room, I think, is a lot of times what I gauge you know, to be able to determine how I'm going to deliver that message. If you walk into the room and think that it's going to be the same every time, I think that's that's where some speakers miss it because there are different energies in the room and you're able to kind of build that. You know, I remember a funny story that I did. I, I learned one huge lesson is never stand outside of your room. Like if you're at a a conference where there's, you know, rooms going all over the place. And, you know, you're one of the speakers in those rooms. I learned early not to stand out in front because I stood out in front 
And like, I kept watching people walk by, you know, <laughs> and they were coming in my room and I got really, the energy really messed me up. So that I realized there, I'm like, oh my gosh, go in the room. It's going to fill up. Don't worry about it. But you know, it was just really odd. So I learned early on, don't stand by the front because people, and then someone comes up to me and says, Hey, do you know where room so-and-so is? And I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So I learned early on to just, you know, keep the energy in the room and just, you know, create that energy. Once you get in, once they get in, they'll feel your energy and, and they'll have a much better experience. Right. And how do you actually psych yourself up before you go on stage? Do you have a routine that you do? You know, I really don't. It's funny. A lot of people have a, per, a certain routine. I mean, I like to make sure that all the handouts and all the stuff in the room is done. I, I walk as much as I can just to kind of, you know, keep the energy um, in, in, in check until I need to. But uh, I don't really have anything special. I make sure and breathe as best that I can. I usually do the four, you know, the four square breathing where you breathe in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, you know, let it out for four seconds, and then hold it again for four. So if you do that, it really tends to to, to ground, you know, me personally, that's just, again, one of the things that I do, but I just love talking to people beforehand in the room, because if I can find the right person with the right personality, then I tend to, you know, talk to that person more. I'll use them as an example. I'll ask them questions because I think the more you can engage the audience, the more success that you're going to have. Uh, in that talk, because we've all sat in a room where one person does all the talking, points to the PowerPoint, reads off the PowerPoint, you know, that it just, it's not really a, a memorable experience in a positive way. So I want to make sure and make it as memorable as possible for everybody in there. No, brilliant. Yeah, love it. Love it. So I know you're a successful uh, businessman. I, I believe you sold one, one of your companies there for 10 million or something like that. Right. Yep. Yep. So I had a company I started in um, 1991 and uh, $0, no sales. It was just me. Literally, I remember the first sale I had. And then, you know, we worked through for, for 20, about 20 years. And then in 2012, we sold, I sold the company to my partner and we had 22 people on the team and we were doing $10 million in annual sales. So what I did with my book, Growing on Purpose, was I took that formula, that how I created that, I took that formula and put it into writing so that people could at least, you know, utilize that. Because a lot of people said, how did you do it? And you can't really just say, well, I did these three steps and it was done, right? I mean, that's <laughs> there's 20 some years of, of mistakes, 20 some years of successes, uh, 20 some years of things that I wish I never had done, you know, there's all of that. So I tried to put that all in my book. And it really came down to, to two pieces, Roy, you know, there's, there's um, three chunks to a business, there's your product or service that you sell or make or do whatever you do, there's what you do. And then you typically have a team that, you know, provides a service for that, whatever that is. And then there's the person that buys it, that enjoys it. So my focus in the book was on how to strengthen your team and how to improve your customer's experience. And when you do those two together, that equals profit. So that's the formula that we used. And that's the formula that I use to really um, have a successful business. Excellent. And I, like just regarding sales, because I mean, most people, are in sales whether they're just they are trying to build their speaking career or whether they're an entrepreneur or, or something like that but what tips right. could you could you give people regarding the sales side of things because some people fear it or they give up after one call and i mean sure. like I, with me it's like unless they tell me stop bringing me that's when i get the turn off switch <laughs> <laughs> well good most people are the opposite roy so you know, I mean, it's so funny because sales is really kind of a bad word. Nobody likes to be called a salesman. You know, it kind of gives bad, you know, recollection in your mind. But think back to your, you know, so I'll ask you, think back to when you when you first met your wife at the time 
you know, oh my gosh, you were selling like crazy. You know, you were trying to sell her on, you were the best guy for her. You know, there was no, you know, you were, you were all in, you know, most likely you were all in. And, and so everybody that says, I don't know how to sell, they can go back into one of their relationships. They can go back into an idea that they had that they wanted to, you know, help another person understand why it was a good idea. So, you know, I think if you struggle with sales, especially in the speaking world, so many people are great at their craft, right? They're great at speaking. They can deliver a fantastic message, but they can't sell a hot dog to a starving man. So, you know, that's where you either do one of two things. You either continue to, you know, learn whether on a podcast or re read a book or jump onto a, a, a sales group, something, you either learn it or you pay somebody else to do it for you. You know, those are, or you just, the third one is you just keep struggling along, but you know, I don't really feel like that's an option. So, you know, I, I, I wrote growing on purpose. I use the name growing on purpose because I find a lot of people that grow by mistake. So in your sales career, you can grow on purpose, you can find an accountability partner, you can have somebody like me come alongside you, whatever it is. But really, if your sales are struggling, you know, it's like Roy said, follow up is a great one. You know, if you have quotes out there right now, if you have proposals out there right now, and you're waiting for the event director, or you're waiting for somebody to call you back, that's already in a, you know, not in the best spot. So, you know, there's, we could spend hours and hours on this. I think the, the best tip that I can give you shortly right here is to go ahead and look and see at all your proposals that you have out there, you know, make a list of them and then put a next step by each one. I'm going to follow up with this person. I'm going to send a video to this person. I'm going to ask for a referral on this, whatever they are. But again, there's so many people that have a whole pile of proposals out there and nothing's happening with those proposals. And so if you don't have a next step lined up after each proposal, then you're really taking the control out of your uh, possession and giving it to, to them. And that's just not the best way for a, a sale to get closed. I mean, they'll call you eventually maybe, but hope, I always say hope is not a sales strategy. So rather than hope that they're going to call, take it upon yourself to call. And so if you get nothing out of today, that would be my one thing is look at every proposal that you have that's open and put a next step by it. And if you can do that today, tomorrow, you'll start to be able to sell and close some of those sales. Just on because I know you're a podcaster yourself, because I mean, a lot of people, they'd be reaching out to me to go on the show. And sometimes I'd look at it and I go, oh, that sounds interesting. But you'd get whether you're editing a podcast or you just have other meetings or something. And sure. because I have like you know, hundreds of emails, it just kind of filters down. And you, you're not going to go through all your emails to find that. And sometimes people, three times... And then there are, you know, you, you reach, and it's probably the same with you because I know you're podcasting as well. Like, but it's, yeah. you know, because you, you appreciate somebody that follows up and follows up, but there's, there's other ones then they do it in an aggressive, they just keep, uh, not just for the thing, but for some sort of sales, they just send the same message like every day. And, yeah. you know, there's, there's, there's like when I was doing anything, whether it was property or anything like that, depended on the kind of time frame. But if it was something that was kind of just ongoing, you know, whether it's a, a once, once a month or once a week. And I also I'm not sure did you do that, but I, I used to be playing around with um, what was the best time to phone people. And I found sure. always on a Friday or even a Wednesday evening, people are in a way, a way better mood. And yeah. I used to get a better conversion. So I used to do a lot sure. of my sales calls on them times. Yep. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. That's awesome. I mean, the statistics show that 48% of our, our competition don't even follow up at all. So let's just round it up to half for simple math. You know, let's say you and I both apply for the same speaking opportunity. And, you know, I don't follow up and you do. Well, you know, right there, you've already elevated yourself higher than me because you followed up. Now, the statistics also show that about the it's going to take you between, I'm going to say eight and 10 times 
of some kind of touch, some kind of follow up, some kind of connection with that person. So like you said, most people do the three and out, right? They, they follow up once, follow up twice, maybe follow up a third time. And if there's silence after the third time, then they go ahead and just say, oh, they're not interested. And it's even worse in sales because then we start saying, well, I wouldn't want to work for them anyway. You know, I mean, we kind of justify in our brain why this isn't going to ha- why we are happy it's not happening, right? Well, the reality of it is, is get creative and find some ways that you can follow up with somebody. I mean, I know for me personally, um, you know, I, I can invite somebody to my podcast to be a guest or to be to listen. I a lot of times send a particular um, episode if somebody said I'm struggling with this. I say, oh, I just did an episode on that. Let me send that to you. Or I could send you a copy of my book for, you know, I send out a lot of copies of my book for free so that people can, you know, it's a, um, um, a guy that I know said this is one of his most expensive calling cards that he has, you know, but there's ways that you can uh, get proactive in trying to get, you know, speaking engagements. And so I just hope people don't just send it, send in the, the RFP or whatever they have, the request for proposal, whatever it is, you know, they send in that, fill out their information and hope that somebody calls them. That's, that's, that's hopefully not what you, what your audience is doing anymore. And like there's been plenty of times over the years with different businesses I've been involved in that somebody, maybe it's the 20th time I call them. They thank me for keep following up because this is most people and you end up getting a sale and sometimes it can be a big property sale. So, you know, it's like for people that are afraid, they think they're annoying the person, the person will tell you if they feel or or they say, look, call me back in a month or whatever. You just listen and make note of it that you don't, you know, like if they say, call me back in a month, don't call them in a week. And once you kind of listen to what they're saying, you end up, there's a very high chance of getting the conversion. Yeah, there's a couple of things here that really are good um, tips that I use. So if you and I were, if I was trying to get, uh, you know, in in front of you, if I sent you a proposal and, you know, for a speaking opportunity and you were uh, an event coordinator or whatever, and uh, you told me to call you back in a month, I'd be like, absolutely, Roy. So just so I don't forget, Roy, um, you know, today is the 18th. So I'm going to say that... um, in a month from today is, you know, going to be the 18th. Are you okay if I call you on that day? And then they're going to be like, yeah, that's fine. And then I'm going to be like, so just so I don't forget again, I'm going to put it on my calendar is like 10 o'clock. Okay. And then they're like, sure. Or no, or whatever you once you land on a date and a time to call them back, I then, if I have their email, which I hopefully do because I've been communicating with them, I send them a calendar invite right from Outlook. So that my, now my follow-up call is on your calendar for one month from today at 10 a.m. And if you accept it, then I know that you're going to most likely take the call and continue the conversation. So do what you can to be, you know, to get onto their calendar. It really is effective if you are able to get to their calendar. And the second thing is, is like, if they're not calling back, it's interesting how this works. If people aren't calling me back personally, and I, I did something wrong along the way, because if, if you're doing the right things, they should call you back. If I did something wrong, then my last call is, hey, you know, Roy, thanks for everything. Um, I just want you to know that if I don't hear from you in the next 48 hours, I'm going to close the file. And there's something about closing a file in somebody's, I don't know what it is, there's psychology, I'm sure there's a ton of research there, but I've never spent the time. There's something there that people don't like that file being closed, you know, so you're, you're smiling, so you can identify with it, yeah. but it just really is a cool way to kind of get them to say, oh, no, 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 we're, we're, you know, don't close the file. I mean, I've had that happen more often than not when I, when I use that. So those are a couple of tips that I would highly suggest that your listeners, you know, implement. And if you guys need help, you know, I'd be happy to help you walk you through that strategy. It really is. Both of them are very effective. 
Excellent. And I assume in your book as well, you probably like you cover a lot about the team. So finding the right team players, because I mean, I know I have found a players and I know that there's been times my team has actually and a shame on me for actually allowing that. But I ruined a good business because I I just tried to constantly improve them, train them and everything. And I just had the wrong people. Sure. Yep, absolutely. And we use DISC, uh, the personality profile disc a lot because and and I like to use it before I hire whether I'm hiring for myself or hiring for you know a client because if again if you're if you're interviewing if you're hiring somebody Roy and I happen to find your ad and it's for whatever it is doesn't even matter the likelihood of me if I'm desperate for a job I'm going to say whatever it is that you want me to say to get that job. So if you say, Dave, are you a team player? I say, Oh my gosh, Roy, I'm such a team player, you know, and in my assessment, it might say he prefers to work alone. He prefers to work independently. He prefers to not share his ideals with other people, whatever it is. I mean, there, it, it's just kind of really helpful. If you're hiring somebody, it's kind of like calling everybody they've ever known and getting the real, I, real, the real, you know, poop on this person, because they, it's right there. They answer these questions, and here comes forty pages of, oh my gosh, this is how to communicate with this person. This is how to motivate the person. This is what drives the person. This is the ideal environment that they're going to thrive in. So, you know, people are great. I'm, I'm great. I just might not be great for your company. I might not be a culture fit. I might not, you know, fit what's going on with the, in the energy of your company. And so assessments like DISC are really helpful to be able to utilize to kind of get an under the hood look at somebody before you hire them. So that's one of the tools that we use a lot to really help with strengthening and getting the best person on that team. I've never actually done the disc one, but uh, I've heard of the Briggs Meyer writing. And there's mm -hmm. a few. Have you played around with other ones before you settle? Because I know that you know you're a big proponent of the disc one, but have you played yeah. around with the others and seen a difference with them? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, like Myers Briggs uses 32 different pieces, and I have to just say between you and me, don't tell anybody, but I'm not that smart. I can four, there's four personality profiles that I look at, you know, D, I, S, or C, there's four. I can remember four. I couldn't remember 32. So I was just like, it was really hard for me personally to, you know, to, um, and again, nothing against that assessment. Find an assessment that works, the end of the day, find a tool that you can use to really help you better understand the people on your team you'll save years, you know, there's people been on your team for years, Roy, you know them well, well, that took years for you to get there. And a lot of times that's costs a ton of money, it costs a ton of time. And really, the failure rate is probably way higher than we want it to be. So why not have a cheat sheet where you already know this person and before you hire them? I mean, why wait till after to find out you have a round peg in a square hole? And then you're trying to shave this or open, you're trying to manipulate the system, either change the job description, change the, you know, change something there or change the person. Why not just have this, you know, really upfront? So it just really is a, it, it's a great tool to be able to try and uh, improve that, that team dynamic. And like you mentioned, you I don't know, the 20 or 22 people. So when you have the team and you said you kind of know, you know, what motivates them and what, what type mm -hmm. they are, do you kind of use this, an Excel system then to kind of that you don't forget that? Because it's okay when you're yep. three or four, you remember it. But yeah. when you've got a yep. big team. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, so here's a great, I mean, what, what I do with teams is let's just pick 10. We'll say there's 10 people in this department. So we run the disc assessment on all 10. And then what you get is you get a map where each one has a dot on the wheel. So you now see everybody on your team. And there's such a revelation, Roy. They go, oh, my gosh, that's why you're that way. You know, in the past, people thought that you were that way because you were mean, you were standoffish, you were not like them. And they came up with reasons in their mind why you weren't that good. 
Well, now when they see that you were built that way, it just takes on a whole different, um, a whole different way. So then once you have everybody in this, uh, in this, um, on this circle, uh, one of the cool things is that everybody gets a page that says tips to communicate, ways to better communicate. And it goes all the way back to how we started this about communication is you and I communicate in different ways. Well, if, I, if I'm on your team and you communicate with me, like I said, the way you think that you want to be communicated with, we're going to have a potential disconnect. So what I do is I say, hey, tell me, this, these are the three ways that I really want to be communicated with. And then you write that in a spreadsheet. And if everybody on the team does it, I mean, you can make this as, as big as you want, or you can make it as simple as you want. But if I know that I'm going into a meeting with Roy at 10 o'clock this morning, and I look and say, okay, remember, this is how he wants to be communicated with. This is what motivates him. You know, that just makes that, that whole meeting that much more effective. And when you do the, the disc test with the, you know, once they're employed, do you actually share it with them? Do they actually, absolutely. you do? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cause they want it. I mean, they want it. We even share it with people prior to hire because this is, you know, this is why we think you're a good fit for this company, or this is why we think, you know, we're not sure yet, or, you know, if there's red flags, again, put it this way. Um, you know, one of the things that is you can determine is are people very quality minded? Are they re or, you know, is quality important to them? Well, if or to me, quality is not as important as an engineer. Let's say we're hiring for an engineering position. Well, if quality is not important to an engineer, we're probably not going to have the right, you know, the right person. For me, I would never, even if I had an engineering degree, Roy, I would never be successful in it because I can't drill down to that minutiae. I don't care that these things work or don't work. That's not my personality. I have a different personality. Well, if I'm sitting across from you, I could easily say, oh, Roy, quality is so important to me. <laughs> you know? And what do you, how do you combat that? You know, yeah. you, again, you could call my past employer, but in today's world, all they want to tell you is, yes, he was employed here for four years or whatever. They don't want to say, oh, you don't want to hire Dave, you know, because they're afraid of lawsuits and all that. So all they do is just confirm you work there. So you're kind of left believing what I said. And again, that's where this really helps. And so, you know, I think going, you know, um, full circle, the it, it's all about communication on your team. It's all about communication when you're out speaking. If you can do it effectively, people listen. And when people listen, they engage. And when they engage, they actually implement what you're saying. So that's the hope is you get that, you know, that simple, you know, process from, listening to engaging to actually modifying their behavior that's what is that's the speaker's dream right there in my in my opinion just just one on the reference one because normally people they give a reference to somebody they got on with you know there could be a lot of people in the company so what i found is a good way about that is when you're talking to the first reference who else did they uh, were they you know dealing with and then if you can talk to that person, then you'll get the true, because right. as you say, you know, oh, I want Dave to get the job. Oh, Dave is brilliant. Dave is, and then they go yeah. to talk to John. No, yeah. he's actually very good at this, this, but his downfall is here. And, yep. but, you know, it's just a way of, uh, you know, checking. And yeah. And it's, it, it is, it's just so getting so hard to get real information on people. And quite frankly, we're not as self-aware, I don't think as, we really need to be. So I might, it might be a blind spot for me. That's my next book that I'm working on right now is on business blind spots. And it's one of those things that we really might not know. If you ask me, am I a good communicator or am I a good team player? I might really think that I am. And that's a blind spot that I might have. Well, you know, you hire me because I said I was a good whatever. And then you find out, you know, a couple months in that I really wasn't. 
it's not that I lied to you. Maybe, maybe I stretched the truth because I wanted the job, but maybe I didn't really know. And that's again, another advantage is the team, the more you get to know the team, the more success you're going to have, just like the more that, you know, your audience that you're speaking to, you know, if you're not doing research on your audience, then you're really going to miss the boat potentially when you're doing your speaking engagement. Absolutely, absolutely. And this might be a strange one, but I'm just curious because sure. I just I just know from myself, you know, I'm just constantly into personal development and everything. Is it something that you should do it maybe five years later when you have a group of employees? Do they change from the disc that they were? Yeah, that's a great question. So typically, uh, the, the assessments that we use, they have a natural style and an adapted style. So the natural style is just Roy on a Saturday morning, you know, with your cup of coffee, reading the paper, whatever your nat, whatever your, you know, routine is on a, on a day where it's just you, you know, that's just you. So that rarely changes unless there's a traumatic event in your life. What does tend to change is the adapted style. The adapted style is how I'm adapting to my job. So let's just say for the sake of your conversation, I'm an outgoing person. I like to communicate with people. My assessment says I need to be in a group setting. I do well in that situation. I do well in a leadership position. Let's say for the sake of the conversation, I took a job with you and it was editing all your podcasts. Okay. Number one, I don't know how to do it. Number two, there's no human interaction. Number three, it's probably methodical, okay, where you're doing the same thing. It's a routine. Some people love that. For me, I don't. So you're, you would start to see a breakdown in that adapted style because I'm not doing what I'm good at. And you don't want me doing it. I mean, it's number one, I'm not going to be fulfilled. I'm going to be griping about it, complaining about it you know, on a regular basis, you're not going to be happy with the outcome. I mean, nobody wins in that situation. So it really, to answer your question, it really, it doesn't change unless you have a big event in your life, but the other side can change based on what your job is. So um, it, it's definitely something that we look at because I don't want somebody that's not outgoing, for instance, to be uh, in business development. If you're afraid to knock on a door or pick up the phone and call somebody you never talked to before, you can pick that up in your assessment. I wouldn't hire that person for a business development role that's supposed to be networking and prospecting and being out as the face of the company. You know, so that's that's kind of the some of the stuff that that you'll see through your assessment. Excellent. And you know, like with the podcast, because you know, I mentioned at the start, you're a podcaster yourself. Are you covering a lot of the, the stuff that you have in your book? Is I mean, obviously it sounds fantastic. And I think people, I recommend people should actually get it because just by listening to it, you know, they'll definitely ben benefit from it. But you might let sure. us know about the podcast. What that's what's the, yeah, the, absolutely. So mine is called the Positive Polarity Podcast, and it's really the intersection of personal growth and business growth. We talk a lot about, we to talk to a lot of people that started their own business, what that journey looked like, you know, did it, did, did it happen overnight? Did it happen over years? Because there's a lot of people in the U.S., and I, I can't obviously speak for your country, there's a lot of people in the U.S. that would love to start their own com company. They just don't know how to do it. So we kind of invest some time and energy to help people. I don't say these are the three steps to do it. What I do is just ask my guests who, you know, have gone through this or are going through it. Some want to go through it. What does that look like for you? Because I, I don't think there's one right way to do it. And so rather than say, hey, if you do A, B, C, and D, E is going to happen. I just um, allow my listeners to hear how other people are doing it. Like some people, like for me, when I sold my company in 2012, it was a Tuesday afternoon and I'm sitting in a restaurant with my partner, get the paperwork done, do get it all done. And it's like two o'clock and he looks at me, he goes, so what are you going to do? And I'm like, huh, 
you know, I don't really know, you know, and the next day I started positive polarity. I mean, I had a little bit of an idea, but it really morphed over time into something. P some people listening would totally panic if they had no income coming in, they had no, you know, benefits, they didn't have a plan, they just woke up and were like, okay, what am I going to do today? You know, and it wasn't that extreme, but it was pretty darn close. So, you know, we talk about that. Some people are like me and some people have done their, their, you know, practiced this for years or planned it for years, you know, making that transition. So, you know, no right or wrong way. We just talk a lot about that. And then what happens to the family, what happens to them personally, you know, it's just a lot that gets, you know, um, un unpacked throughout that process. Listen, Dave, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. So how can people get in contact with you? Yeah, absolutely. I'm on LinkedIn, um, for sure. Dave Melinda there or uh, positivepolarity.com is the website or Dave at positivepolarity.com is the email. So and if anybody wants a book, be happy to get them a copy of the book. I just have to remember that it probably costs a little more to ship it. I shipped one book to uh, another country and it was like more expensive than the book so <laughs> so maybe i'll just send out an e-version the kindle version or whatever but if somebody can't afford a book or they want one uh, just reach out to me and i'll we'll figure out a way to get you one that's excellent i appreciate it Dave. thanks very much and i put all the links in the podcast description awesome thanks again for having me I had a great time cheers so that's all for the Speaking Podcast. You'll find all our episodes on speakingpodcast.com or on BitChute and YouTube. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, a five-star rating, share with your friends. It all helps. Until next week, take care.